I'm Nina Nola, the daughter of Dalmatian immigrants. At the turn of the century, along with nearly a thousand others, my father's father came out from former Yugoslavia to New Zealand to dig Karagam up north. My mother came out after the Second World War as a teenager. For both families, it was poverty and politics that drove them across the world in search of a better life. And they found it in New Zealand. These immigrants settled around Auckland and in Northland, and they were known as Dallies because they came from the beautiful Dalmatian coast of the country now known as Croatia, a land that has always tugged at their heartstrings and mine. I definitely think there's something in the soul that yearns uh, to be back there, I say, uh, my life is here, but my soul is there. There was always part of me there, the very, very strong part there, and there was part of you here. So you were always sort of mixed up between your feelings about it. I don't think of myself as just Croatian. I do think of myself as Dalmatian because in Dargaville, we were called the Dalmatians. And that's what I knew, and that's what I grew up as. I went back the first time to Kortula and I understood immediately when I saw the village that my father and grandfather came from and where my family still live. I understood immediately why um, they had to leave all, all those, well it would be over a hundred years ago now when my grandfather came here before the turn of the century for the first time. And there's just nothing but slate there grey slate everywhere and the mountains at the back are just so barren it's just grey and barren and dusty and to even make one grapevine grow I think would have been an absolute labour of love and everybody dreamt of going to America now you must understand that to them the world was America most of them and my mother too had brothers or sisters in the real America but it was all America Amelia Battistich is a Dalmatian New Zealand writer. And she writes about the dislocation of leaving your home, your culture, your civilization. There was a very old civilization along the Dalmatian coast. Leaving all that behind, coming to a country where you had to sleep in houses made of sacks. Um, she expresses all those migrant experiences uh, in very emotive, precise language, which is so skillfully crafted. Amelia's writing is about planting roots in your new country and roots in your old country. The father guardian of the monastery had read about New Zealand and he had actually been to Vienna and seen the cowrie gum there. And he said, there's this place in New Zealand and there's, there, there's this cowrie gum to be dug and, and I think you could go, all go there. My uh, grandfather, Tony Tomas, he came in, uh, I think it was 1906. He landed here at about three o'clock in the, in the afternoon and they tell me he sunk his first holes at six o'clock at the bottom of the hill here. And his holes are still there today. And Dad says you can tell, you can tell by your grandfather's holes, they were, they were oval. All his oval holes were oval and they were neatly dug. He's, he, that's the type of hole he's in, and he said, you can pick his holes down here. He said, then he married um, a married girl from here. When they came here, they virtually had nothing. And they had to come somewhere like the gum fields or uh, to uh, earn themselves an income. In the 20s and 30s, from here to Hypera, right through the ridges were just shacks and uh, gum diggers all the way through. There would have been at least a thousand 
and dig it. There, there, was, there was prejudice against many Dalmatians initially because they didn't work as individuals. The, uh, the British gum digger that came out, if he found gum, he wouldn't tell anybody, he would just work it on his own. If he was a Dalmatian, if he found some gum, he'd tell all his relatives or the people from his village. And it, they'd come in like locusts and clean it all out. And that upset the British gum diggers who lobbied Parliament and Parliament uh, did bring in special regulations against Dalmatians. They couldn't dig on quite a bit of land. Uh, I think they could dig on Crown land and, and they had to get special permits and pay fees to be able to dig. They did live with, with Maori women. They did have families with, with other Maori women. As things got on, got on and they got they got enough money to send back for their brides, they would ex actually send back for their brides and sort of drop the Maori woman, you see. And um, I think it, it caused a little bit of animosity, but them days it sort of, it was part of life. That, that was a new thing that was happening in this country. Yugoslavs were the first people that were sort of um, very well accepted by Maoris. They got on well together. All the young men were going to America, to New Caledonia, to Australia, to New Zealand, and there was a great shortage of, of um, husbands, likely young men, they could marry. And they would write to their brothers or cousin, brother or cousin on the gum field, and say, well, you know, if there's a likely young man who would like a wife from his own village, well, uh, you might be able to arrange an introduction. So, of course, it was by letter. So the postmen of the world were playing Cupid. The young man would have his photo taken on the gum field, and I've seen that, be dressed in their best, and always have a gold watch chain to show how prosperous they were, doing very well in New Zealand. And she could have, in response to that, had her photo taken. Also, of course, he'd look at that and think, yes, well, and a match would be arranged. When the boat came into Auckland, she was at the ship rail with the other proxy brides, all of them waiting to see their husbands for the first time, all looking down anxiously at the crowd of faces on the wharf, trying to pick the one face out. She looked at the unfamiliar scene, listened to the noise of the people chattering in the strange English tongue all around them. And my dad looked up couldn't see my mother coming off the boat at all and then all of a sudden his sister-in-law said well there she is she's coming onto the gangplank now and that's her and pointed out and dad looked up and saw this little <laughs> shriveled up lady coming off the boat who'd been ill for nearly three months of the whole trip she was about seven stone three I think when she arrived here and he looked up and he said, my God, is that her? He says to his uh, sister-in-law to be. And then he pulled the photo out of his pocket and had a good hard look at the photo and took another hard look at this woman hanging onto the gangplank coming down, down onto the wharf. And finally, she came down and stood alongside them and my auntie welcomed her. And I can remember the bride so vividly. I can see the picture of my mother in the, her bedroom dressing the bride, putting the veil on her, you know, and she starts to cry the bride and she's crying because suddenly she's realising that she's come to a strange land and she cried for her own, for her own people not being there. And then for the honeymoon they went straight back to the gum fields, the gum diggers camp, and it was just on 2,000 people at this camp. It was a massive camp. I don't know, there might have been no more than a dozen women there. Took her straight to the cookhouse and introduced her to this Mary Ho Hire, the cook. Of course, Mum saw this Mary lady there with the moko and the tattoos on her face and smoking a big pipe, puffing away there, quite a buxom sort of lady. And she ran, she cried. She didn't know what to say. Because I married legally in, in Yugoslavia. Married by the proxy. I make mis big mistake. 
Because the die, think of it, I never do it again. I said, I write letter to my sister, older sister. I said, listen, Francis. I say, I married Rudolf, and I come to New Zealand, young and silly and stupid. I shouldn't come to New Zealand. I come here, bush, goat, cows running around. I didn't see any friend. I didn't see any of my, like, close family. Just husband, he working all day in the farm. I'm lost. I said, girl, come to, uh, she think to come to New Zealand, we better get hard big stone around the neck, throw yourself in the deep sea. <laughs> and my sister said to me, oh, mom, I think she's not happy over there. And the funny thing was that she was soon used to it all. The rough kindness of the man, his clumsy lovemaking, the hard days and harder nights on the sack bed. I would go with them and stay with them on the farms and the lonely little houses and ostensibly to teach them English, but at the same time they were giving me something that I as a child was not aware of, but I saw this loneliness, I felt it, I sensed it. The old country faded from her thoughts. She began to feel herself part of something in the making. The acres of land became an obsession with her, as with him. And when their first child was born, and she brought it home from the hospital, she held it up to the land and said, See what we are making for you. At the moment, I'm completing a master's degree in English at the University of Auckland, and I'm writing a thesis on the work of Amelia Batterstitch. When I first met Amelia, there was an instant bond, and I can only put that down to cultural factors, that we understood each other so clearly. And in fact, the thesis has been a very, very uh, rewarding and enriching experience for me because through meeting Amelia and studying her work and what she's written, I've come to have a fuller sense of what it is to me to be a Dalmatian New Zealander. Oh, I thought I heard you come, Nina. Hi, Amelia. How are you? Oh, mm. right. Lovely to see you. I've brought you some tomatoes for my oh, garden. Look at that. It's a big one, isn't it? <laughs> We're lucky the best That's a real Dalmatian tomato. <laughs> isn't that my favourite? Yeah. That's right. Nina and I, just from the very start, I mean, it was like my own daughter, my granddaughter, myself coming back young again with all the scholarship Nina has. And Nina and I, we had a wonderful 12 months. You know, we're going to Dargaul. Yes, and looking forward to it too. Oh, yes. Now, and she always has another story, another photograph, Sophia, something interesting to show me or share with me. I'm Rose, and that's me there. <gasps> that's my sister <gasps> Lena. And, and how old were you here? Eight or nine. Northamara always is muddy and as grey as you say it is. Well, Probably not, because the river... I wanted to take Nina with me to Dargaville to show her where I grew up and where my stories came from. Sure, that I can remember. I was very little. I'm sure I saw a, a boat with sails, a ship with sails come by the river. I don't buy our place, but I don't know if that's true, but there were the steamers. And at night, you'd hear the thump, thump as they loaded onto these wharves, or they stopped and there'd be somebody calling out, you know, from the jetty or calling to somebody So you would stop here? Oh, no. At this Tokotoka walk well, here? Well, everyone. Mm. If they stop at everyone, this is my remembering of it. Amelia and I went to the museum, which is full of relics of the gum digging days. Uh, built up in uh, Prory Bay up the Kaiwi Lakes in 1902. That's out of split swamp cowering. 
but that is a genuine gum digger shanty. It would be very unusual, wouldn't it, to have it made of wood? I was no, thinking, well, they, the, these were the permanent ones, and they were a palace going on the old diggers telling me. And it's the only gum digger shanty in New Zealand registered with the Historic Places Trust. This is a historic building inside a building. It's rather grim inside, isn't it? Well, that, no, it well, that was typical. To the I know. <laughs> they, they, the, it was either the this live in a cave or... In a cave. Cave. After um, the First World War, this was just scrub and tea tree all around here, and with many, many gum holes. It wasn't until uh, just on 1930 that uh, some of the gum diggers eventually bought little pockets of land around here and established their own uh, farm, dairy farms over the years. But there was diggers here right up until uh, 1952. That's when the last of the diggers uh, finished digging on the block out here. And those huts were Noel Hilliam here. took us to see the caves where the Dalmatian gum diggers actually lived. Outside the cave is a fig tree, transplanted from the homeland by a lonely gum digger a hundred years yeah, ago. Yes, and I tried to take it. Uncle Tony gave me cutting of that fig tree in my backyard. Wherever the courtyard is. Going into the old digger's cave. Oh, this is mm -hmm. So they actually lived in here, don't they? Yes, those four diggers actually li lived in here. The real, real history of the gum, gum fields. You can see the shape, there's a lot of the erosion is filled mm -hmm. in here, about three or four feet. But you can see the shape where the beds were carved out of the sandstone. Two on this side and two on that side. See the little cubby hole where they had the candle? Perhaps they were laying in bed. Mm -hmm reading, yeah. and uh, I remember the old Mingy Mingy, that was the mattress, low-lying scrub from out the coast there. Still great stuff, like an intersprung mattress. mattress. Look, Amelia, there's Batterstitch. I know, look at it. Frank Batterstitch. Batterstitch. It's Frank Batterstitch. Is going to grow, Amelia? Yeah, it's going to grow. Grow a little on this tree. That was a lot of this, I think. <laughs> Yeah. A bit of hormone on the bottom, it yeah, should grow. Yeah. <laughs> it should grow. Look at it there. A bit of cortula there. A bit of cortula. Yeah. There, Tony. It's a hundred years of history in that little cutting. Mm -hmm. Very, very strong character. People, honest, straight as a day is long. Good friend, bad enemy. Some of these lonely, desperate old men there they lived all their lives on the gum fields, had nothing to go back to, nothing to live for, and uh, in time the isolation got them and uh, they unfortunately did away with themselves. They used to um, use the old shotgun. This was, as one said, the favourite way of uh, <coughs> losing themselves on the gum fields. Well, this is Aipara Hill. We're up on Aipara Hill now. One of the most famous, I'd say, of the, of the gum fields in the Northland. These are the remnants of what was, what is, what's actually left over from the old gum digging days. It's sad to see the place like it is now and think of all the memories of the people that were up here. I would say this is the largest collection of uh, cowrie gum left in the world today that's been dug and uh, stored. In recent years, all the cowrie gum that we could sell is the top quality cowrie gum, which we call uh, white gum. But uh, there's virtually no one digging it now, and the supplies have just about run out. We've still got all the old ledges, and uh, even today, we have sons of gum diggers come back here to Sweetwater. We had some here a couple of weeks ago. And uh, they go through the ledges and say, well, my father was in Sweetwater in 1932 or 1928. And uh, we can even work out that their living costs varied from six pounds a week, uh, a month to 10 pounds a month. Well, when we moved into Dargville here, it was a shed that they used to feed calves in. So we moved into that. That was our first, that was the first home I can recall, you know, 
quite clearly. Prior to that, we just lived in gumfield shanties and uh, corrugated iron sheds. But this was a calf shed with a corrugated iron roof. And I can recall my mother and father cleaning it all out, scrubbing it with sand soap and scrubbing brushes and boiling water, boiling water out in the copper, getting it all cleaned up, making a table up out of some cowrie timber, scrubbing hanging out of that. And there was an old open fire and eventually we got a wood range in it, I can recall that. And they used to bake bread and do all the cooking and there was always a pot of bully beef and a camp oven full of stewed beef which would stew there for a day or so and you could always get it. No fridges, no such thing as a fridge, no luxuries whatsoever. After the gum ran out, um, many Dalmatians moved from Northland to Auckland. They went into fishing and vineyards and orchards because they came with the land. Uh, they grew grapes and olives and fished back home, so it was a natural thing to do here. They came here from uh, Croatia in 1910. Dad came along with his, uh, there was five brothers all together, and uh, Dad was 14 and a half years of age. They went north gum digging. They weren't impressed with gum digging, and they moved here permanently in 1919, start to clear the uh, scrub, and um, a lot of hard work went into it at that period. There was no income. At the time, wine was termed to be the drink for barbarians. Um, there was an article in the New Zealand Herald refers to how the Dalmatian people were going to corrupt the Anglo-Saxons with their wine. And uh, it took a long time to get New Zealanders to drink wine and they wanted strong wines which, in which they can get drunk with very quick. So they wanted uh, sherries and ports. So the government at the time uh, made it difficult because you had to buy two gallons of uh, Sherry Report, which was a lot for anyone to, to buy. Over the years, many other Dalmatian families, as well as the Babbages, went into winemaking. Families like the Nobelos, Brykovichs, Selaks, Delegates, and we all became very successful at it. It's a typical family uh, scenario. Uh, everybody's involved, you know, um, as children. If I went back to mum and dad's day, uh, as children, you were just expected to pull your weight. And that still goes on. There was this image about Dalmatians are all hard workers, but my stepfather wasn't. Uh, he was a guy who liked a good time. And when he came to Auckland, um, his main activity of, um, to, to produce funds was he ran a, a gambling den. And the first thing he did was he accommodated the biggest room down in the basement and he put in this big two-up table and he had a partner. And uh, every night or every second night they'd be gambling in there. 50% of them would be Maoris, then the others would be Dalmatians or other Kiwis. And this went on for quite a while and um, one night the, uh, the police arrived with the Black Mariah and they go through our bedrooms shining a torch at us and my mother's running around so to leave us alone that we're sick. And, um, but one of the things with the Dalmatians they found in New Zealand that if there was anything that was good, there was a law against it. So gambling was illegal, uh, drinking alcohol or making it was illegal. Uh, so all the things that were normal to them back home where they could make their own spirits, and that um, was, there was a, a law against it in New Zealand. As a teenager, we had two clubs, two Yugoslav clubs, that had dances each Sunday night. And all the Dalmatian girls went to these dances, accompanied by their parents or their brothers. Parents would be on both sides, girls down at one end, and the boys all towards the doorway. And you could have one dance with a girl. If you had two, you were almost on the way of getting, you know, on the road to getting engaged. Three was, you know, you're, you're there. And the Kiwi boys would occasionally come, but they'd give up because um, they could find it, you know, they soon found out they couldn't take a girl home. There was none of that. You just, uh, it wasn't allowed. 
Girls weren't, girls weren't even allowed to smoke, drink alcohol, it was just taboo. The boys could do anything. We looked at some of the photos and probably 75% of the dancers would, be, would end up marrying each other. So it was, a, it was like a matchmaking uh, or marriage bureau to, to some extent. What this club gives and what the dancing gives is a focus for them. I think it gives them somewhere to hang their hat. I think it gives them something to strive for. It gives them an understanding of their heritage. And they know that if they work hard and they continue to come, that you know they'll get a lot of enjoyment and satisfaction out of it. I think the best, the best thing that I heard is I've actually got grandmothers in this club that danced way back, and they're friends. And now their granddaughters dance together, and they are friends. And yet they live in the furthest parts of Auckland. Elbows. High point in my career has to be when we took the group back in 1989 to Zagreb for a folklore festival. It's the first time that a group has ever gone from New Zealand. And I remember one old man, he was crying. He just couldn't believe it. He said, I can't believe that our young people, at the furthest point, I mean, we must be the furthest country on earth from, from Zagreb. Um, he said, I can't believe that people, young people on the other side of the world are singing our songs and dancing our dances. My mother came over from the island of Hua when she was 16 and a half or 17 with her uncle, who thought he'd bring her over to give her a new life. And I start wishing on the falling stars to come to New Zealand. I start thinking about it. Oh, wouldn't it be lovely to go over there in America, uh, which was New Zealand, but we all called it America, and be so rich and eat all this wonderful food. That was the most thing, because at that time, that's all we were eating was the uh, blitva, which we call, which is serve beet and potatoes and a bit of brown bread. And um, after a while you get sick of it all that. So it would be lovely, I can eat all the meat and food. We arrived in Wellington, and next day we took off in the cars towards the Auckland. Um, and it was getting night time, I tell you this one. It was funny, there were so many sheep everywhere. They all laughed about that. And I, all of a sudden I said to my, to my auntie Franina, I said, look at all those sheep over there. And, they haven't brought them in this idea. They're going to get so cold. And there's no goats. I said, where's the goats? There's all this huge chaos, and, but not, not any goats and all these sheep. And they all laughed like mad because over there, you know, she brought them in every night um, here in New Zealand. Life, it was, was busy and hard, but um, this dream of becoming rich and plenty to eat, yes, I, I realized you couldn't have it unless you worked, and you worked very hard to get it. I used to work in the orchard picking. And I used to see, you know, beautiful summer day, and I used to see people that were coming by fruit. Oh, we just off going to the beach. We're going to the beach and I bought some peaches to eat. And I used to think, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful? I'm dying, because I absolutely adore the sea and swimming. But uh, eventually came, here we are. We are now at the beach and, um, and dreams. If you work hard enough and if you are lucky to have your health, you, your dreams do come true. I do think as I'm getting older, I notice I am thinking more and more about over there. You're really torn between two. You're not anymore there. You don't fit there, you don't fit here. You're sort of in, in, in the middle of those two. Um, but then if you ask me now, where would I like to go and live? Would that question here? Having a Dalmatian heritage in New Zealand means that you're different. I think I learnt that from a very early age, but it's something that I'm extremely proud of, and it's something that 
when I've lived in a city like Dubrovnik, where Napoleon was, where Richard Coeur de Leon was, um, you, you get this sense of history and tradition and things that have gone before that New Zealanders really don't have any comprehension of. Did you dream about Dalmatia? All the time. I never dream about a New Zealand. I always dream about a Yugoslavia. For years, or oh, for about more than 20, 25 years. I think every day, every day, when is sometime I tell you through, I'm still now, I dream of my house and my home and villages where I walk, where I go for swim, every, everything, you know. I am really stricken by what has happened. Just, well, because war for me has always it's been the great blight on our lives, on the lives of the world. War divides people who don't know each other. I constantly ring my cousins up to see how they're faring because some of them are in Mostar and that's a real hot spot. And it's quite hard after a full lifetime of being a Yugoslav to suddenly not be a Yugoslav and I find that quite sad. So now I'm suddenly Croatian. It's destroyed so much. It's like when somebody throws a stone in a pond and the ripples just go on and on and on that reach even as far as here. Um, it's just awful. Uh, for three months I didn't know whether my aunt and cousin and family were okay in Dubrovnik. You wake up every morning, you know that they're being shelled, you know that there's no water, that there's no electricity, and half of your mind is with them the whole time. You feel that, um, that you cannot help much, you, so, so when anything happens that you're helpless to helping, and I think that's, that's the hardest thing. My mother and I said that we would definitely come back together sometime soon. So this year it, it happened. We, we organised it and we came together. And we got out of the aeroplane and there was Tita Vera, my mother's sister, and her husband and Helena, my cousin, and her little daughter Nina, who's named after me. And all you want to do is rush out and you know, rush into their arms and cry and it was just so exciting, it was wonderful. Driving from the airport, the first thing I, I saw was the United Nations trucks. That to me really brought home that there had been fighting, that there was a war going on and that things had changed. And I said to Helena, oh, you know, does this happen often? She said, they're, they're everywhere. We went immediately the next day to the ferry to come to Starigrad, which is about a two-hour trip. Mother and I always sit on top on the deck with Tita Vera because she's coming over too to see you know, Nonna and the family here. And when we get to the point in which we enter the harbour of Starigrad, it's, it's like it grips your heart. And once again, Mother and I go silent because we, you know, we can't speak about how we feel. And walking through the streets to the house in Malosello, which is where Nonna lives, 
We were both very excited, nervous naturally, and it's always such an um, emotional moment. <laughs> The most wonderful thing for me is when Nonna looks in my eyes and he says, you know, you've come. And it says everything. And we planned the big lunch for the following day so that we've sort of got time to get used to having everyone in the house. And that was really lovely actually because um, we had the lunch down in the old courtyard where Mother used to, as a young girl, have her meals. And I'd never had a meal down there. And it was just fantastic. The sun was shining through the pergola and there was trees and beautiful cactus flowers. Actually the flowers came out just for the lunch. They hadn't come out the day before so it was perfect timing. And it's just beautiful. Starigrad is all inspiration. It's such a rich place. In fact, it's 2,000 years old. It's richer in a way than Venice because it has so many of the beautiful features of Venice, and yet it's unspoiled and it's untouched, and it's you know un undiscovered almost. And when I walk around the streets here, it's like I'm just soaking up all sorts of inspiration. And this is where we used to go up and down, up and down, sun, sun there, sun there, hand in hand and like this. And we used to go up and down and up and down here. <laughs> in your best clothes. In your best clothes. And this way we used to meet everybody. This was a socializing mm. thing, just walking back with the walls. We used to go for hours going up and down, roll around here. It's quite the fun. Just the young people or the old oh, people Oh, old well. one too, and the little children, they used to all come and just everybody just went up and down here. <laughs> Croatia is very Catholic and we went to Split to attend a religious festival. This festival hasn't been held for the last 50 odd years since the Second World War, so this is very momentous and important occasion for the people to Split. It's full of the feeling of celebration, of freedom, of possibility and of spirit. And everyone was there, the priests, nuns, Croatian soldiers, politicians, and all the local people.
I didn't go to New Zealand because you wrote me in the letter that how we can, uh, I and my family and my two children can now uh, come to the New Zealand because of the war here. Like you, like you, you uh, belong here or that Belo is special be to you? Belong to this big country, yes. or, uh, former Yugoslavia. But now when, it, when it's Republic of, uh, of Croatia, I know that I am, uh, I am a Croat woman, how to, to say in, uh, in your language. Um, this, I can breathe now. I, I have feeling that I will start to breathe now more in um, um, more freedom. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 you said that to me last night. You said the city is starting to breathe. And I have uh, one experience, uh, uh, a special experience, what I can before see only on the movies or in the films or the read in the books. What's that? Uh, the war, for example, yeah. the killing, the, all, all this evil in this country. So gross, no? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's no words it's for it. It's so hard to explain. There's no words. Because I always want wants to know how, how you how uh, how your land's looking, uh, where you walking, mm. how, how the the land is. Uh, green like uh, this, or uh, we don't have a grass, many, many yeah, grasses. And we have only grass. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a big houses. We still don't yeah. have here a big houses. I've been here five times, and it's the first time that actually felt that I was sort of looking deep inside what I am and um, how I'm feeling about things. And of course, it'd be wonderful seeing my father. That has been lovely. And seeing his smile on his face when we arrived, that is really worth a lot. And then I thought, will I be happy if I stayed here? I've been thinking about that sort of. And then where do I belong, here or over there? It is lovely to come here. You sort of go back to your childhood. It actually, it's often you don't miss the people as much as you miss the places that you've been and things you touched and things you did. It it's really refreshes and fills your soul, I think, again, which you take with you when you leave. But um, that was childhood, that was youth, that has finished. Eva. Nana. Molim. Dobra, puna. Dobra, yeah. Maybe it's the last time we're going to see each other. Yeah, he said he's very happy that we're here. <laughs> there might be that will be last time that we all see each other here, especially that me, his daughter, and Nina, that we're all here together. He's very happy. <laughs> well, the first thing I'll tell Amelia was that it was everything I expected it to be and that to return to the family is one of the most important things you can do, and she'll, she'll understand that. And that I discovered my heart was here again, as it always has been. And I think I'll tell her that, that things will, will be all right, that the, pe the people sense that things will be all right and that they want a positive future and that the optimism will survive. It has been emotional. Um, but at the same time, it, it does, and motion was in, in a good sense, in, in more or less finding myself and being more positive where I belong, in New Zealand. A part of me belongs here more than ever. I want to be a part of what's here in a constructive way, you know, to help build up something here, as well as build my life that I have in New Zealand. You're two people, you're two places, but home is really... My mother, father used to say it, and in that story that I'm having difficulty finishing it, I'm using, my father used to say, home is where your bread and butter is, and never forget it. And home is New Zealand, where I was born, my children, my grandchildren. Everything I know, everything I am, I owe to New Zealand. So I tell you true, New Zealand based country.
come and roll on. This program was made with the help of your broadcasting fee, so you can see more of New Zealand on air.